What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the reveal of the number seven team in my 2019 NFL Power Rankings. We are getting so close to the top here. So a deep dive into the Chicago Bears. This is a team that is coming in a lot higher than a lot of people that have followed this channel really probably expected. You look back to my take on the Jacksonville Jaguars last year when I ranked them 23rd in the power rankings, and there's a lot of obvious parallels between this 2018 Bears team and the 2017 Jags team that did go to the AFC Championship. Those parallels would be a historically great defense. History tells us that repeating as the number one defense is incredibly unlikely. Often those defenses are teams that had a remarkable run of health and then get picked apart, you know, just a, a starter or two in free agency, which did happen with this Bears team. And that defense just isn't quite that top, 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 number one, all-time great elite defense. And the other parallel, of course, being the quarterback play here. Sometimes these teams that won 10, 11, 12 games are going to have a harder time consistently winning that number when you don't have high-level quarterback play, which at the end of the day is the most important thing from a year-to-year -year basis in the NFL. But there's a lot of reasons that this Bears team is not the 2018 Jacksonville Jaguars, and a lot of this video is going to be talking about why that is the case. You know, I said the Jags, you know, bet your house that that team is not going to the playoffs. I wouldn't do that for this Bears team. I think this Bears team is a really, really freaking good football team as is evidenced by this number seven ranking. So as we go, if you enjoy, if you learn something, please do hit that like button. It's the easiest way to support my channel and share this video. Also subscribe, turn on notifications so you don't miss any more of these top six reveals as we go. Another way to support the channel, if you're shopping for tickets, use promo code FRANCHISEGUY on SeatGeek. You're gonna get the best prices there anyway, and you can save $20 on your first purchase. If you're new to the series, what we do here is we go through the roster, we rank each position, how they stack up against the rest of the league. While we do that, you are going to be looking at my own custom Madden roster. So while it is a video game, they are my own ratings and it's a nice graphic to use to show how I perceive each player. After that, we're going to go through the schedule, game by game, talk about this team's Vegas over under, my win total expectations for this team, also talk playoff odds, division odds, Super Bowl odds, all of that good stuff. So make sure you stick around to the end of the video so you don't miss any of that. So let's get into the roster here, starting with the quarterback. And, you know, we mentioned some parallels to that 2017 Jaguars team. And Mitch Trubisky here coming in tied for 26th for me for the Bears. It is a bit of a parallel. But the one thing I will say, uh, this is a rare positive note on Mitch Trubisky, is that going into last year, I knew full go that Blake Bortles was likely going to be the single worst starting quarterback in the entire NFL, and I felt damn confident in that. I, I don't feel that confident about Mitch Trubisky. You know, even if he doesn't develop at all here, he's still not the worst quarterback in the NFL. Mitch Trubisky is not Blake Bortles. So let's talk about what Mitch Trubisky is. And I look at his Eagles game against the playoffs being the perfect example of how I perceive Mitch Trubisky. Going into that game for my playoff predictions video, I said I don't trust Mitch Trubisky for four quarters in the playoffs. I predicted that the Eagles would win that game. I caught a ton of flack for this game, was told that I have never watched the Bears play football. I predicted that the Bears would lose 17-16 to and they lost 16-15. to and sure enough, Mitch Trubisky for the first 46 minutes of that game, really until about four minutes left in the third quarter, looked incapable, was missing throws, going through his reads slowly, was hesitant with the football, making the same terrible decisions, forcing balls into double coverage, was lucky to not throw two game-breaking interceptions in the first two quarters of that game. But then down the stretch, he like flipped his his clutch on and looked like an elite quarterback. And that's what you get excited about Mitch Trubisky for, but you also can't ignore all of his flaws. He also had a ton of help last year, the number one defense in the NFL. He was the only quarterback in the NFL to have his receivers drop less than five of catchable balls during the season. The offense in general stayed remarkably healthy. Outside of Kyle Long missing some games, they really didn't have anyone go down. 
Mitch Trubisky was in the bottom five in terms of percentage of accurate throws to open wide receivers. He missed close to 30% of his throws to open wide receivers, so you have accuracy questions. He led the NFL in turnover-worthy plays and was also number one in the NFL in turnover-worthy plays that did not result in turnovers. Those are all stats that point to serious regression for Mitchell Trubisky. Now, you also do acknowledge the thing that you always hear from Bears fans, that he's a young player, that he showed a lot of growth last year, that he only started one year in college. Like, yeah, that's all true, but I think you're also understating, you know, how far Mitch Trubisky has to go. He, he might be on the upward trajectory, but it's not going at the rate you would like for, you know, to, to have a guy that you consider a franchise quarterback. It's not like we haven't seen young quarterbacks come in and in their first five starts look like elite guys. Carson Wentz, Baker Mayfield, Deshaun Watson, Patrick Mahomes. I, I don't think I need to keep going. I think you get the point. So yeah, he's a, he's a young player. He's going to continue to grow. He's whatever. He's in the second year of this scheme. And those are all reasons he, he could get a little better as a player, but you also can't just ignore all of those other things I talked about with the inaccurate throws, the terrible decisions that he frankly got lucky on a lot of plays that did not result in interceptions. And please, Lord, do not mention the fact that he made a Pro Bowl. Oh my God, I'm so sick of hearing about how good players are because they make the Pro Bowl. How many quarterbacks had to back out before Mitch Trubisky was selected? Not to mention he plays for the Bears, who have probably the most Pro Bowl voters on Twitter than pretty much anyone in the league. And they won a bunch of games, so people are naturally going to vote for their quarterback. Like, stop. So, to me, Mitch Trubisky is not going to be Blake Bortles. He's not going to tank the season for this team. He might tank individual games. That's definitely a concern for me. But I do think this team can win with Mitch Trubisky, especially considering he's still on a rookie contract and it allows this team to have a pretty remarkable roster around him. Behind him, you got Chase Daniel, Tyler Bray. You know, Daniel, he'll be able to, you know, persist here, Nick Foles style. Uh, could probably win a couple games with this roster. He even did it last year if Mitch Trubisky missed a game or two. Uh, so let's talk about the rest of this roster here. Moving on to the running back here. So Jordan Howard is gone. The average casual NFL fan is going to see that as a downgrade because he's a perennial 1,000-yard rusher. He's made Pro Bowls. He's a fantasy football star. Uh, but in reality, this offense is going to open up a lot more without Jordan Howard on the field. And I think it's actually going to allow Matt Nagy to be much more comfortable in his play calling. You know, Jordan Howard's a very good running back between the tackles. But the problem with Jordan Howard is when he's on the field, you know the Bears are running the ball. Because he is, he's basically, you know, makes it where you only have to cover four wide receivers. He was that bad at not just catching the ball, but, you know, catching it and then get going. Like, he's just not a very quick starter. So he's gone. Who are, who's coming in here to replace him? They draft David Montgomery in the third round. He's very similar to Jordan Howard, except for he has smooth hands and receiving instincts. Not an elite athlete, just like was a flaw of Jordan Howard, but I do think he can at least be on the field and defenses are going to have to worry about him. So I think David Montgomery has an excellent year. Uh, you know, he's got to be someone that you mention in the offensive rookie of the year conversation. Uh, there are a couple good quarterbacks this year that will be starting so that's going to make it tough but he's going to have a great year uh, could be a true three down back here my comparison for him was James Conner just a really solid running back not going to have a lot of questions about him I don't know if he has the physical explosiveness to ever be uh, an elite running back his best path to that would be to have the elite shiftiness vision like a Le'Veon Bell pretty unlikely but wouldn't say it's impossible then they signed Mike Davis really good signing there kind of a change of pace back Really explosive player, doesn't have a lot of finesse to him, but he can be a mismatch problem for this team. And then, of course, you have Tariq Cohen, who is, you know, top three receiving back in the NFL, top three player in the NFL in terms of stop start ability, just a, a absolute headache. And with Jordan Howard gone here, he's going to be able to get the ball a little bit more, which is a good thing for this team. So while they don't necessarily have that, you know, true elite three down back, I have no concerns about this team getting production from the running back room. And frankly, I think in terms of headaches and having to deal with this offense, getting rid of Jordan Howard is actually an upgrade here. Then they also have uh, Taquan. Then they also have Kareth White, a seventh round pick out of FAU. Don't see him playing a whole lot here. 
So 23rd at running back for me. And then at wide receiver, this team's got some studs. So Allen Robinson, he just made my list of most of the most underrated player on this Bears team. To me, it, it, if he was in a situation where going back to his Jacksonville days and then here with Mitch Trubisky, if he was in a more traditional offense with a, a good quarterback that can consistently use the entire field, I, I really don't have any doubt that Allen Robinson would be in the same conversation in the top 10 wide receivers in the NFL. I just think he's fantastic. And even though he doesn't put up the numbers to back that up, he really does everything you look for in a true number one wide receiver. He's got great release. He can catch the ball in traffic, excellent route runner, can sit down in zones, just a, a true number one. Uh, and the Bears are, are lucky to have him uh, and lucky that you know Jacksonville let him go, to be honest. Uh, you've got Anthony Miller here, second round pick last year. You know, I said earlier that this team didn't really have a whole lot of injuries. Really, the, the main one they did have was Anthony Miller. Now, he's a rookie. You shouldn't be really relying on a second round rookie anyway, but he was a little beat up, and he showed a lot of flashes last year. If he can stay healthy and, and be better in his second year, that's going to be a, a really nice upgrade for this wide receiver room. Uh, and then you have Taylor Gabriel. He's a good mismatch problem. Surprisingly good hands for a smaller guy. So you really have a great trio there. And then you have a bunch of young guys worth noting here. So you've got uh, Riley Ridley, a fourth round pick here. I mean, this is almost becoming an embarrassment of riches. I, I thought Riley Ridley was a first to a second round wide receiver. He's one of my sleepers in this draft. But I was really bummed to see him go here because he's probably not going to get on the field a whole lot as this team's fourth wide receiver. But I think he's a total stud. Excellent route runner, great foot quickness. If something happened to one of these wide receivers, Ridley should be able to step up and be a starting caliber player. They have Javon Wims, a player that they got in the seventh round, who had a third to a fourth round grade last year. Really great depth there. And then they sign uh, Emmanuel Hall as an undrafted free agent who is just a freak athlete a lot of people expected to get drafted in the fourth to fifth round. So three really intriguing, developing young players there at the depth. You've got Cordero Patterson here as well. Taquan Mazel, a converted running back, is going to be playing some wide receiver here, trying to maybe play the Tyreek Hill role, maybe a backup uh, to Tariq Cohen as well. It's kind of that gimmicky trick play player in this Chiefs offense that is coming over from Matt Nagy. Uh, so they just have kind of an embarrassment of riches at wide receiver. They do come in tied for 13th because there's a lot of good wide receivers in the league right now. The one thing that I, I will say is can this team uh, repeat as one of the highest contested catch rate teams and a team that had the least drops in the NFL. Like I said, Mitch Trubisky, the only quarterback in the league whose receivers dropped less than five balls on the season. That could be, even if these guys improve, be some just natural regression there. You know, drops happen. It's just part of football, and this team uh, just didn't have them last year. And the, it felt like every game these guys were making pretty remarkable catches. So they do need to repeat that uh, to help out Mitch Trubisky, but I do think they can do that. Uh, and then at tight end, you have Trey Burton, you know, an undersized tight end, oversized wide receiver. He's a slot guy, a mismatch weapon. Was a little bit disappointing, but he's another guy here that you just have to keep an eye on because he's such a great athlete. You got Adam Shaheen, a second-round pick. He's a little oversized to me. I was never a huge fan of him. Maybe he can take a step up in his third year. Uh, he did show some signs last year. I, I guess Bradley Sowell is a tight end now. I don't know what that's all about. Uh, ben Broniger, he's kind of that career backup tight end type. So the tight end room doesn't really move the needle a whole lot. Trey Burton's an interesting piece, but it really is about these wide receivers. So they come in tied for 13th. I love the depth here, and they really do have a lot of playmakers here around Mitch Trubisky. Uh, and then this offensive line, this is another huge reason why this team is not the Jacksonville Jaguars, is they have an offensive line here, like a really good one. J the Jags just didn't. Charles Leno is one of the more underrated tackles in the NFL at left tackle. Bobby Massey, certainly a starting caliber right tackle. Not a star by any means, but you could certainly do a lot worse there. The interior is incredibly solid. You have uh, Cody Whitehair is actually going to step out and play guard now. He's a stud. James Daniels, a second-round pick last year that I thought was a total steal. Uh, and he's going to come back and play his natural position of center in his second year. And he had a slow start. 
a young player. He was only like 20 or 21 coming out of Iowa, and he was dealing with a position change to guard. Uh, so he actually did not start for the majority of last season, but he did end up getting in there at the end and did not look very bad. So uh, I expect him to really be kind of a breakout player at center this year. Uh, and then Kyle Long at right guard, he's got to stay healthy, but he's always going to be one of the best guards in the NFL when healthy. So, I mean, from left to right, you don't have a weakness here. It's just a, a studded offensive line. The depth's a concern. This offensive line stayed remarkably healthy last year. Uh, Kyle Long was really the only player that missed time. And they had a guy in Eric Cush that was able to uh, really come in there and provide some depth. He's gone. Now you have Ted Larson coming over from Miami. That is a downgrade in terms of depth. Uh, you got TJ Clemmings, who cannot play football. You've got, what, Rashad Coward. Uh, you, you know, you really have no depth here at all. So they have got to stay healthy like they did last year. Your offensive line oftentimes is only as good as your weakest link. So the offense as a whole gets a very respectable rank of 16th. And that that's why this team is not the Jacksonville Jaguars is, you know, yeah, their, their defense can be great. But the problem with the Jags is I did not expect their offense to be able to move the ball at all. This team has, for one, just a better quarterback than Blake Bortles. They have better wide receivers. They have a much better offensive line. And most importantly, they have an offensive coach that knows how to call a game. And that's what really makes this team scary is that if everything can, can go right here and Mitch Trubisky can be the player that, that we saw at the end of the Eagles game and not at the beginning of the Eagles game, then there's no reason this team won't win the Super Bowl this year. But that's a lot of things that do have to go right, and you're projecting a lot of growth there for Mitch Trubisky. But this defense is still going to rank number one in the NFL for me. And this is another big reason this team is not the 2018 Jaguars. That team had an outlier season from their best defensive player in Calais Campbell. Well, Khalil Mack doing what he did last year, we know that's not an outlier. I feel much more confident that the Bears are going to have that game-wrecking elite defensive impact than I did in the Jacksonville Jaguars. So Khalil Mack is the number one reason you, you point to why this defense can repeat as the best defense in the NFL this year. That said, they did suffer some losses here, including their defensive coordinator. So we're going to go through this thing, uh, talk about who's going to have to step up if this team's going to repeat as the number one defense in the NFL. Starting with the run defense, I do rank this as the best run defense in the NFL. Uh, up front, you got Akeem Hicks, Eddie Goldman. You know, enough said there, but you got Bilal Nichols, Jonathan Bullard, uh, Roy Robertson, Harris, Nicholas Williams, a great pair of linebackers an aggressive secondary, like good edge guys. Khalil Mack defends the run very well. Like it's just a dominant run defense. And that's really all you got to say. Let's move on and talk about the pass rush. They also rank as the best pass rush in the NFL. It's not just Khalil Mack, who is the best, most dominant edge presence in the entire NFL. It's what the rest of these guys can do. The next best pass rusher here is Akeem Hicks, who is just a monster on the inside. But then you got Bilal Nichols, a fifth round pick last year that really broke out. You know, he's going to come in here and rotate with Eddie Goldman and, and really be, you know, this team's second, third down uh, interior rusher. But that's also Roy Robertson. Harris can do that. Jonathan Bullard. They're just incredibly deep with this pass rush. And then opposite of Khalil Mack, you have two guys that are starting caliber. Leonard Floyd still really hasn't reached that potential uh, that he had as a really high draft pick, but you could do a hell of a lot worse than him as your second edge guy. And then Aaron Lynch provides kind of a, you know, one-two punch there because Floyd is the really flexible, bendy speed rusher. Lynch, a little more of a power guy. Lynch, a little better against the run. Floyd, a little better as a pass rusher. But both can certainly play, and it provides some really nice depth there and flexibility schematically. So you love what you have in this pass rush. Uh, in terms of uh, other names on the depth there, that's really it. You got Isaiah Irving and Kylie Fitz. Not really expecting a whole lot there. Uh, and then the inside linebacker position, they come in sixth. So Danny Trevathan, stud veteran player, really instinctive cover guy, but he's got the size to thump and play the run as well. For him to be a team's number two linebacker is almost embarrassing for a lot of teams. 
um, because you got Roquan Smith here who projects to probably be even better this year in his second year. He had the holdout in camp, so he had a bit of a slow start. Really did come on in the second half of last season. And I think he's going to continue that momentum. You know, he was a, a blue chip player in that class. The coverage he offers on the second level of the defense is is just ridiculous. You know, he, he's as fast as a lot of cornerbacks out there. So you can put him on tight ends. He's got the size for that. You can put him on slot wide receivers. He's got the speed and quickness for that. And he's just a really heady, smarty, aggressive player uh, that can really make plays for this defense. And, you know, if this team's going to lose a couple guys in the secondary here, lose their defensive coordinator, a big reason this team may be able to repeat as the number one defense, unlike the Jags or the, the Broncos of 2014 or 15, whatever year that was. You know, if Roquan can enter elite territory as a second level defender, you know, into the Deion Jones, you know, even Luke Keekly, Bobby Wagner range of defender, that is going to be a, a path for them to do that. They got some depth here. Nick Kwiatkowski can play in a pinch. They signed Kevin Pierre-Lewis, and then they are developing Joel Egan Booneyway, was actually a fourth-round pick last year, a really good athlete, a guy I'm sure they might see as the long-term replacement for Danny Trevathan if he can continue to develop. So a really nice group of linebackers there. And then in the secondary, they're going to come in tied for sixth for me. So you bring in Kyle Fuller back here. You know, it's, it's kind of funny, like, the, the reports came out today that the Packers were making pretty strong offers for Khalil Mack. It, it's kind of funny how, how often this team has blocked the Green Bay Packers. Uh, last offseason, they tried to get Kyle Fuller from this team with, as a restricted free agent. They tried to get Khalil Mack from the Raiders. They tried to sign Allen Robinson in free agency. Well, the Bears are three for three in terms of beating the Green Bay Packers out for those guys. And it really you know was evident last year in terms of roster talent. Uh, you know, just imagine if those three names were on Green Bay instead of Chicago last year. It could pretty quickly change the narrative. But Kyle Fuller had an awesome season last year. You know, ha has dealt with injuries earlier on in his career, but the talent was always pretty clear. Really nice athlete, a good press corner, a really instinctive zone guy, and then showed strides uh, in terms of his man coverage ability as well. It, it helped out to have the pass rush that they had here, certainly. But he's thrown his name into the conversation for a top 10 to 15 corner, and you really like what you have there in Kyle Fuller. Uh, and then you have Prince of Mukamara on the other side, kind of a journeyman uh, starting caliber player. He's a nice player, definitely a guy that benefits from having the elite pass rush up here. You know, these lengthy press corners that are really physical at the line of scrimmage that also might be a little more stiff and have a hard time covering for longer periods of time. You know, Prince Mukamara, I don't think it's a coincidence that he had one of his best years of his career here behind this pass rush because he's able to jam the number two wide receiver up front and just lock him down for a second or two as Khalil Mack gets in there to disrupt the quarterback, uh, as opposed to having Prince Mukamara, you know, running all over the field like some other teams might uh, have asked him to do in the past. Uh, and then in the nickel, they are going to lose a really good player, Bryce Callahan, one of the better slot corners in the NFL. And they're going to bring in Buster Screen here, who's been a you know, low-end starter as a slot corner throughout his career. Elite quickness, and he shows some really nice flashes, but just not the smartest player out there. Now, I will say last year they did uh, have Callahan suffer a, a couple injuries, and they actually went to Sharik McManus, who... Up until last year, I think everyone thought was just a special teamer. But Sharik McManus, um, in this surrounding core here, was able to plug in there in the nickel and actually be a well above average player there as that nickel corner. So could Buster Screen come in here and have a career year? That actually seems pretty likely when you look at it. So you're really not too worried about losing Callahan. It's a slight downgrade because Callahan really did have some nice cover skills, and he, he would come up and hit you in the mouth as well. Uh, as a physical run defender so it's certainly a loss um, but you do do a good job of supplementing that loss uh, with a guy that can certainly play and if he can't maybe Sharik McManus can repeat what he did in the slot last year that's a little hard to expect but it could happen uh, and then just to make sure they have enough competition to replace Bryce Callahan they go out and get Duke Shelley in the sixth round good player out of Kansas State uh, a slot corner 
uh, you know, this front office is just so smart. Like they know exactly what they need, how they can get it. And, you know, they, they recognize, okay, that's going to be a, a big weakness potentially for this team. We got to make sure we get Buster Screen in here. We uh, draft Duke Shelley and really beef up that competition at slot corner so the teams don't have uh, a point on this defense to attack. So one of those three guys will emerge as the starting slot corner, and I expect one of them to be uh, a pretty good player at that. You don't really have a ton of depth as outside corners. I'm not a big fan of Kevin Tolliver. He was an undrafted free agent last year. You know, really no one of note. So you do have to keep those corners healthy. Mukamara and Kyle Fuller, again, those guys, I don't think either of them missed a snap last year. So, uh, you know, you really need that to repeat. Then at safety, you've got Eddie Jackson, a total stud, a top five safety in this league, emerging as one of the rangiest, most instinctive interception agents in the league you know he's kind of coming for that crown uh with earl thomas potentially on the decline uh, on the other side of 30 coming off a broken leg so you know you, you know what you have in eddie jackson he's a, just a dominant free safety here uh, and then they bring in haha -Ha clinton Dix to replace adrian amos and that's a been a big debate between bears and packers fans uh, of who's the better player because a lot of bears fans actually think this is an upgrade I think that's just being kind of lazy and looking at haha Clinton's uh, Clinton Dix's interception numbers. You know, Adrian Amos sure has never been uh, a big interception machine, um, but for one, Clinton Dix like he just isn't the athlete that Adrian Amos is. Adrian Amos is a four-four kind of guy. Clinton Dix is a four-six kind of guy. It shows in their range, and they have in, uh, Clinton Dix has inconsistencies in coverage. Adrian Amos has been one of the most steady forces there as a safety magnet for this team. And I will say that a lot of times Jackson and Amos had a very good chemistry. And you would see times where Amos would almost pass off an incoming receiver and say, all right, Eddie, you go break on that thing. I'll be the safe man. I'll make sure that I'm there for the tackle if you miss. And he would miss just as any aggressive safety might at times. Haha -ha Clinton Dix is the same style as Eddie Jackson, where he's going to try to make that break on the play or he's going to try to cut off a guy and it can screw up his pursuit angles you know that's why you see some of those higher interception totals for clinton Dix. you know it, it pretty clearly is a downgrade but you know getting haha -ha clinton Dix for like two or three million dollars is a very good replacement here and he could have his best career year here surrounded by this talent so you know both the bears and the packers won in that situation to settle that debate you know, you really don't have to look much further than the contracts these guys got and the fact that Clinton Dix is now on his third team in about 200 days to know that Adrian Amos is just a better player. That, that really shouldn't be a debate, but Bears fans can also be just really happy that you were able to get a starting caliber safety on the cheap. So I really like what this team did to supplement those losses. They didn't have a ton of room to improve this offseason, right? They went and gave Khalil Mack a ton of money. They traded um, their first round pick for him. They traded their second round pick last year for Anthony Miller. So they didn't have a whole lot of room to grow, but to bring in Buster Screen and HaHa -Ha Clinton Dix, two starting caliber players for almost nothing, really good job by this front office to fill the two holes that this team lost. Behind him, you got DeAndre Houston Carson, Dion Bush, not really relying on these, these two guys to step up into that void. So the secondary as a whole comes in tied for sixth. So the, the talent on this defense is unmatched. It's still, with despite the losses of Amos and Bryce Callahan, the, the best defense on paper in the NFL. Now, you also got to keep in mind, this team stayed pretty remarkably healthy on defense last year. You don't necessarily expect that to happen. It's a big reason number one defenses have a hard time repeating. You do have a change at defensive coordinator. Vic Fangio is a special kind of coach, but Chuck Pagano can definitely be a good defensive coach. That's another great you know, hire by this coaching staff, by this front office to replace what they had last year. I, I don't think it's that big of a deal to go from Fangio to Chuck Pagano. You know, I, I will say that Fangio has historically gotten the most out of his pass rushers. I don't know if you can really say the same about Chuck Pagano. But Khalil Mack and Akeem Hicks are such transcendent talents that I don't think that's really going to make much of a difference. So I don't put a whole lot of weight in the loss of a defensive coordinator, but there is some turnover there for sure. So I still rank this as the number one defense in the NFL. It's a big reason I'm comfortable ranking this team in the top 10. 
Though I will say that this was a very special defense last year, and as much as you want it to repeat, you do kind of need everything to go right, especially from a health standpoint. So let's talk about my expectations now. So this team's schedule, pretty favorable. Their over under is nine and a half. So I do have them winning 10 games here. Think of something we've said with like Seattle and the Rams with these last couple deep dives is, you know, in a very competitive division and conference, you want to get your easiest non-division opponents on the road and you want your hardest opponents at home because, you know, it's a three point swing in terms of how Vegas thinks. So Chicago gets that. They have at Washington, at Oakland, at Denver. Those are nice draws. And in return, they get the Saints at home. They get the Chargers at home. They do have to go to Philadelphia, but they also get Dallas and Kansas City at home. When we did the Seahawks and the Rams, those were the kind of teams that we said, oh man, they gotta go to those stadiums. So Chicago does have the benefit of um, kind of the luck of the draw with getting some of these home games here. So I, I certainly see this as a team that can uh, get into that 10 to 12 win range, especially if they can go into Denver, go into Detroit and pick up those wins, which are worse teams. So this is going to be a really good football team. I, I think in some respects, their offense may be better next year, but I do expect that their defense may not be quite as dominant as it was last year, even if it is still the best defense in the NFL, it might not be as good as it was last year because that was something really special last year. But if they do stay healthy, they should be you know, about as good as they were defensively last year. So right now they are plus 170 to win the division. I do like, like we said, that they got some of those games at home, Dallas, New Orleans, Kansas City. I think that is going to certainly help this team get a little bit of an edge in this race and we'll see where green bay does come out when we get to their deep dive but you know vegas kind of like me sees this as, as kind of a three-sided die they got uh, chicago plus 170 green bay right behind them plus 190 and minnesota right behind them plus 210 it's one of the tightest uh divisions in the nfl in terms of gambling odds right now you know personally i tend to you know if you if i'm here to offer gambling advice I shy away from betting on teams that do have worse quarterback play. It's just the most predictive, consistent variable in terms of week-to-week -week NFL predictive analysis. But if, if you're a Trubisky believer, you think you see something in the film that I don't or other people don't, you know, go for it. I certainly would not stop you from making that bet like I may for other teams. Super Bowl, they're 14 to 1. Again, you've got the Trubisky factor there, but if they can stay healthy on defense and repeat as a elite number one defense, and then maybe they do take a couple steps up on offense. Anthony Miller stays healthy, the offensive line stays healthy, the new running back situation opens up the play calling, and then Trubisky really kind of flourishes in that system. Like, sure, they could win the Super Bowl this year. There's really no reason. They got them at minus 140 to make the playoffs. I think that's about right. I, I think this team probably, if they don't win the division, is still going to get you know 10, maybe 11 wins and should be a wild card team. There's a little bit of downside that they don't make that, but uh, I will say them at plus 110, no, to make the playoffs compared to the Rams at plus 275, no. That is just a market discrepancy in my opinion. I think the Rams at plus 275, them saying that they're almost three times more likely to make the playoffs than the Bears. I think that's nonsense. I think the Bears have an easier schedule and a better football team. And then the over-under, you know, I would just, I would stay away from that myself. I think if they're going to go over nine and a half wins, you're better off just betting on them to win the division, to be completely honest. And nine and a half itself is just pretty close to where I have them. I think they could go nine to, or 10 wins pretty easily. So, you know, we'll see when I finish all of these deep dives. I am going to reset and do my full season predictions, my official predictions. So we'll see where the Bears come in. You know, they should be right on that fringe of either winning this division or being a wild card team. And then depending on home field, you know, this this is a team that very well could be in the Super Bowl conversation next year. So I, I, I think I, I don't have the same pessimistic outlook of this team that a lot of people may have expected me to have. I'm excited to really hear from the Bears fans what you think I'm off on, what I'm right on. Rest of you NFL fans, let me know as well. Please do hit that like button. Cheers as always, and we'll see you for the next one. Peace.